All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Thanks so much for being here and for our Zoom audience as well. This is Dr. Aaron Weiskittle, and he is professor at the University of Maine. He wears a lot of different hats, but today I will just say that he is the director for the Center for Research and Sustainable Forests there at the university. And we're really excited to have him here to talk a little bit about forestry in the East and across the country. Um, for those of you on Zoom, we do have a Q&A section. So any questions that pop up during the talk, please just put those into the Q&A. And if you have any other issues or chat related things, just put those in the chat so that we can kind of keep those separate. And I'll uh, turn it over to Aaron. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I appreciate Sarah and Matt being such gracious hosts. It's really nice to be here in person. That's a real honor uh, when Sarah reached out. I thought she had the wrong Aaron, so I just clarified that. Uh, I'm not an ologist, so it's a little bit of a stretch for me to come to the Cary Institute, but uh, I'm honored to, to talk about the forestry and all the great things that we're doing in Maine. I think this is a real opportunity and I, I would like to kind of convey that uh, today. I was really interested to come here. Uh, I thought I had been here in 1999 as a Harvard Forest REU student. The only memory I can recall from that, that was a few years ago in an undergrad, was this dark cavernous building that we all spent time in. I got here yesterday afternoon. I thought, man, I must have been dreaming that. But people have, uh, have reconfirmed that, that that was actual case. So a real pleasure, a beautiful place. and. Uh, I'm excited to be here. So what I'd like to talk about today, uh, and I realize the seminar format has kind of changed a little bit, so I'll try to keep it interactive and moving quickly as I'd really like to have your input on this. Um, I've been in New England for well over 14 years now. Um, spent time on the West Coast, I'm from the Midwest. Uh, I think given all the issues that we're talking about today, New England is one of the few places that we can do it all and do it all in a sustainable manner. And I'm very proud of that. I'm very excited about what we're doing in Maine, but I think it can be replicated and serve as a model for the rest of the U.S. So I think this is, this is really opportune, opportune times. So many of the issues, as you can see here on the left, are things that, that are universal. Um, decarbonization, climate change, um, just this whole changing of our uh, social economic fabric, especially as we enter this post-pandemic era. Uh, we see a lot more interest in outdoors and, and actually people are migrating to places like Millbrook or, or Northern Maine, um, which is a very different contrast between the urban and the rural center. Uh, we have changing labor force as well. Um, we have changing green products. We have interest in green engineering. Um, and we have, as many of you saw with Egypt, we have this large debate about how do we move forward both as a, as a country in the US as well as globally. Uh, just like New York, uh, we're expecting fairly large changes in Maine. Um, as I'll highlight a bit, Maine is kind of a, a chasm of all the ecosystems since we run from a coastal environment to very high uplands. Like New York, we're transitional as well. We have many species at that northern southern fringe. And so where you'll see the direct impacts of climate change is where those species are, are kind of already at their uh, bioclimatic uh, extremes. Uh, so we're expecting warmer, which we've seen obviously today, December, uh, well, probably almost in the 50s, sunny, not the type of December that even when I got here, that was uh, uncommon, no snow on the ground. Um, and so a big part of this, although we focus on the growing season, it's, it's these changing winters that I think are an exciting topic to, to think about. We're also expecting to get wetter. And as we saw with the, the rain over the last couple of days, that's not always a snow. It's, it's these uh, rain or snow events or, or uh, just heavy, heavy rainfalls, which I think have important implications for the ecosystems that we manage. So to start off kind of globally and, and kind of I'll start off uh, at the largest scale and kind of narrow it down quickly and talk about what we're doing here in Maine. But this is recent work that a colleague and I, Chris Woodall, put on a year ago. We were very excited to get this out. And maybe it's the post COVID world where uh, it's hard to get news picked up or, or other things, but it really kind of laid flat and has been dormant for a while. But it's something that I think is very important as we think about our forest. Um, 
forests are in the news a lot, the wildfires, insect outbreaks, uh, just the impacts of drought. But I think, as I was talking with Sarah, I think nationally, we're kind of gone through this land conversion, uh, particularly here in New England, where our forests are starting to reach that biological age where they will start to self thin and you'll see natural mortality. And so what this graph is here showing is we're using FIA data uh, from across the US. We use relative density, which is just like a, a measure of carrying capacity. So uh, where are the forests in terms of their current density to how many trees could be there biologically after accounting for things like forest type, uh, climate and all the other factors. So this is basically time one, which is 1999 to, to roughly 2010. So a lot of blue, this is not a political map. Uh, so blue is less dense. Usually as we think about uh, blue, a relative density of a 0 0.3, 0 0.25, kind of a young maturing forest, uh, still growing into that stem exclusion stage, a lot of growth, a lot of stems there. Uh, and then as they reach this kind of 0 0.5 to 0.55, they begin to self thin and mortality starts to accelerate as they're crowding in the resources that become limited. And so you can see that a good portion of the Eastern US has suddenly now kind of reached that tipping point. So I think without even talking about climate change or management strategies, our forests are naturally increasing in density and are kind of at this threshold that I think the next decade or so we'll, we'll see that play out. I will say, interesting enough, uh, if we zoom in and look at this again, the kind of the sweet spot for forests is a relative density of about 0.35. All the trees have enough space. There's growing room. Um, they can continue to grow. They can continue to sequester. Uh, you don't have stresses from insects or other. They, they got the vigor to be able to, to um, defend themselves. So again, 1999 to 2012, a lot of blue, a little bit of red spots. Uh, and then interesting enough, which really surprised us, and, and if I step back just one slide, what also surprised us was California, right? Everyone kind of, as we talk about the wildfires and the impacts there, it really has not changed that much as we've gone from denser uh, forest, uh, as we were expecting, the less managed areas would have increased in density. It's actually probably the, the reverse. Um, whereas Maine, which we all kind of, or at least some would acknowledge, is a fairly heavily managed working forest, it actually it showed the largest increase in relative density, which, which really surprised us. And I'll talk a little bit about that. I think the, the key here, as I hit on at the title slide, I think it's, as we saw in 2010, uh, Maine was declared a national uh, federal disaster zone because we had the closure of five pulp mills. Uh, and suddenly these low grade markets that could help incentivize managers to maybe go into stands earlier and manage, uh, now they haven't had those incentives to go in. And so you see this increasing uh, density that we think has important implications for the future. I think coupled with that is also the shifting composition. Uh, so not only are forests are becoming denser uh, and you're seeing increased competition beyond just the, the climate change impacts. Uh, this is in particular American beach. So not a, a favored species by many, has tremendous ecosystem values in terms of wildlife and biodiversity. Uh, but obviously with beach bark disease and now with uh, the beef foliar disease, uh, it's tough to grow as, as, a, as a desired species. And so what we've seen here, this is the 1980s, roughly 1980s to early 2000s. Uh, the red is kind of areas of high beach abundance. Uh, now with beach bark disease, it's very rare for a beach seedling or beach sapling to grow into a full-size tree. And so this is mainly the presence and absence and abundance of uh, beach saplings. Um, and what we've seen really is areas even like in northern New York, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, a real strong presence of beach, not only in terms of places where it hasn't been historically, but in where beach gets established, it tends to uh, dominate the regeneration dynamics. So this, this is a bit of a concern. Also, as we noted, beach likes to thrive on the variability that we're seeing. So as you go from these dry summers to these wet winters or, or just the variability, compared to sugar maple, yellow birch, um, it likes to derive, it likes that variability. So this is expected to continue. This is one of the biggest challenges for managers in Northern Maine, because once you have beach established, it quickly changes the management options you have on that, uh, for that particular stand. 
All right, so I talked to Charlie about this yesterday. Um, this was another highlight of this was the getting at our carbon markets. So as I highlighted in that early um, slide, uh, we now have people interested in forest that know really nothing about forest. And so this is a complication, especially as you start to throw big money at this. And so these are the carbon offset monies, carbon offset markets. This is work that Tony D'Amato, Chris Woodall and I uh, led, uh, basically asking the question is, is, do current carbon markets set baselines that are undesirable? Right now, the uh, primary goal with a lot of carbon markets is increase the amount of stocking. Uh, the more carbon, the better. And as we saw with those earlier slides, what you're doing is pushing stands to higher relative densities, which puts them at risk for other disturbances. That's what we're seeing in California with the wildfire. I would, I would argue that's a lot of uh, having stands at non-optimal densities. And so what our, uh, what our analysis tried to do uh, is highlight two things. Uh, so this dark blue here is basically um, the, tip, the typical uh, sequestration strategies. And as a simple forest ecologist, this is, this is a no brainer. And some people criticize this as, as it's nothing new, but I think for people that are running carbon markets, this is a novel concept. The idea here is that uh, the dark blue here meets the current standards. So as we've talked about the baselines, these are basically the baseline is the minimum. Anything above the, the minimum is, is what you're compensated for. So even though the dark blue meets the standards and has relatively high sequestration, the drawback here is that compared to uh, those that do not uh, meet the uh, requirements, this light blue here is showcasing mortality. So although your growth sequestration is similar, because you have these higher densities, your mortality increases, obviously. And when you compare the net sequestration here, actually you see tremendous overlap. So the benefits are, are actually minimal uh, to trying to target these higher baselines. In contrast, so rather than using an absolute uh, baseline metric like, like Bezoar or just total carbon, you could use something like relative density. So again, with relative density, we know there's a fairly sweet spot between a 30%, 60% relative density. So this would incentivize people to manage the overstock stands. So you could do things like thinning to bring them to a lower relative density. Also, you could underplant or do certain targeted strategies to bring stands that are under the optimum threshold into that zone. And when you look at that, um, essentially now the dark blue is those that exceed that you can see that you can shift that carbon sequestration to a more positive net sequestration growth. And so we've talked to a lot of people, Nature Conservancy, um, the Environmental Defense Fund, about adopting baselines that are more biologically driven rather than just these simple absolute metrics. I think the key though, is the amount of land area that we're talking about. So um, here on the left here is the amount of timberland across the entire US between basically the initial time period and uh, CARB2, which would be basically this, this current decade, you can see that most of the land area already exceeds the baselines. And so there's not this incentive to go out and do certain actions. Whereas with relative density, as we're showing in our previous graphs across the US, that higher, much redder relative densities, a much larger fraction of the US timberland, which is where you'd wanna target for carbon offset programs, you could actually impact a much greater acreage. So, so two things, you could increase the amount of net sequestration and you could uh, have a larger land area that's available for these offset programs. All right, so that's the national scale. I think there's a lot of confluent forces. And so how do we kind of move this narrative forward? Um, as I wanna highlight, Maine has a long history, just like this part of New York. Uh, it's been a working forest. Uh, we didn't have the ag encroachment like, like portions of New York. So it's mainly been forested, um, but what I'd like to emphasize is that proximity to the coast. Uh, there is Canada around. We often like stick out on, on a US map, but we're, we are surrounded by the Canadian border. Uh, but the Gulf of Maine is, is, is an important part of our, our bioclimatic factors. And as I mentioned, uh, these are seven distinct uh, climatic zones. And so we really have a high diversity of, of climate. Um, all the way from the alpine areas of Western Maine, the islands of Northern Maine, and then this kind of coastal area uh, down East that we talk about. 
And then uh, the yellow is our classic spruce fir. So this is that boreal forest kind of at the uh, southern extent of its range. Uh, and then this kind of teal or, or gray color or uh, green color is basically your temperate hard forest, more like what we're seeing around Cary Institute. Uh, and right around Bangor or Orno area is where we transition. We both change in that climatic zone, but we also shift in that transitional forest. And so we're really seeing the direct impacts uh, of climate change. We're seeing a lot more balsam lily adelgid in this down east area, which has an impact on balsam fir. And as I'll mention a little bit, a lot of this northern region is, is 40 to 50 years post the last major spruce budworm outbreak. Uh, which is, is impacting a lot of acres up north. So I think this interplay between diversity of species, diversity of climatic zones, this whole shifting uh, uh, seasonal nature of our climate has direct implications. The other important part that I'll highlight is we have a diversity of landowners with very different objectives. And I think this makes it a very exciting time to kind of find that common theme that people are interested in and try to work towards that common goal. Uh, uh, I've seen a real shift in, in thinking and being proactive. Uh, as I highlight it, um, probably more similar to New York than Vermont or New Hampshire, we're primarily privately owned. Uh, in terms of private ownership, we're about half small landowners. So that's that Southern half of that, that um, the state and that Northern half, that yellow part of that map is primarily uh, large industrial forest landowners, but even that can run the gamut. We now have John Malone, who owns well over a million acres in Maine. Uh, the Nature Conservancy owns well over a half a million acres. The Appalachian Mountain Club owns well over about 150,000 acres. Uh, and then you have the whole REIT and Timo who manage for very different objectives. So even though we call it large industrial, it's a very mixed ownership and you see that play out on the landscape. Uh, I think, uh, I would like to just highlight some of the successes of Maine. We're an early adopter of third-party certification. I think we were an early adopter of, of conservation easements. So now well over half, uh, 17 million acres of forest land in Maine, about 12 million of that is timberlands. Uh, so you got 10 million acres that are now third-party certified, uh, well over three decades of certification. Uh, we do, we're roughly about 20% conserved as well, so about 4 million acres. So, so I think people have been very progressive in maintaining what is a working forest, but also uh, maintaining high standards on what our management looks like. As I was talking to Charlie last night, um, maybe some shifts here in the management in New York and some of the growth uh, to removal ratios for many of our forest types, whether it be uh, privately owned or not. Uh, we're well above that that one threshold, uh, and we're actually seeing excess growth, which, as highlighted earlier, might be one of the reasons that we have that relative density at such high uh, values. As as our pulp markets declined, uh, people did not were able to to kind of uh, capture that growth. Uh, just like uh, our forest, so we're we're as although we like to claim ourselves as a spruce fir forest. Uh, most of our forest is in this transitional uh, hardwood forest, very similar to, to the forest around Millbrook. Uh, and that's also reflected in our harvested volume. So hardwoods make up about 40, 45% of our standing volume. They still make up about 46% of our harvested volume. And I think there's a lot of innovative uses that, that the University of Maine is, is now focused on. And I would say our harvest volume, although we're, we're, we're still a federal disaster zone, our harvest has remained relatively constant and, and what we've seen is a shift in the industry. So even though we've kind of made the news and, and there's all this disaster of one pulp mill closing versus another, uh, wood is still being harvested and being utilized uh, within the state. I think because of that, as I've highlighted, these are our, our harvest volumes. Uh, we haven't declined as dramatically as we've seen in other regions. And I think one of that is because our markets remain relatively stable. So this is pricing. Uh, even though the markets fluctuate and there's dynamics as we've seen with, with lumber throughout the entire US, these have remained relatively constant and landowners can make strategic investments knowing that those markets will likely, likely be here as they go forward. And I, I would say I'll get into this a little bit more, but our future wood supply is very positive. And so there's a lot of external uh, interest in moving to Maine, in particular, our softwood abundance because of that post spruce budworm outbreak in the 70s and 80s. 
we have a lot of forests that are now maturing and are operationally uh, thriving in terms of, of potential. That's scattered throughout the state. Uh, we do have an age class distribution that I think is related to the budworm outbreak. But this is a lot of what people are asking about is, is building new facilities. As you know, with any investment, we're not talking about $10 million, $20 million investment. These are, these are often $100 to $200 million investments. And so uh, having a long-term supply of wood and being able to capture that supply and make sure that that's available, not in the short term, but also in the long term, is an important strategic investment. However, I'd like to mention just, I don't know if it's probably not made the radar here because of, of lack of spruce budworm, but as I mentioned, Maine is bordered by the three province and we have a really interesting large landscape experiment playing out right now with spruce budworm. For the last decade, kind of this Gas Bay area of, of Northern Quebec and along the, the St. John, uh, there's been a very heavy infestation of spruce budworm. I would say at its peak, we're talking well over 15 million acres that have been defoliated by spruce budworm. Uh, they've been impacted by fires now because of the drier summer and you got a lot of dead and dying trees. Um, and this is pretty heavy defoliation, even despite being 10 years into their, their outbreak. So there's a lot of this black spruce boreal forest that is just primed for, for budworm. In contrast, New Brunswick um, right here, is doing a what's called an early invention strategy. So they've invested heavily in technology in terms of both remote sensing as well as the, the ability to apply uh, uh, BT, a natural occurring uh, uh, insecticide, uh, and do early targeted spraying. So they're, they're 15 years. So despite the dynamics that are happening in Quebec, uh, they've had a few hot spots, but they've aggressively kept them uh, minimized. And what you see is, is they can actually not detect any populations right now. Interesting, the wind patterns all change how the budworm moves and the winds have been pushing them further north, but it's only a matter of time before essentially the winds shift and now we have hot spots in Maine. And so the question now with Maine landowners, are they gonna take an early invention strategy like New Brunswick, which takes investment, it takes cooperation across landowners, it's relatively easy in New Brunswick when you have one large landowner, basically the province itself, whereas Quebec has basically let the budworm play out in its natural dynamic. And it's really actually is, is they treat it well over 1.5 million acres uh, this past summer uh, in an attempt to try to catch up. But I would say the cat's already out of the bag and, and you're not gonna catch up to this scale. So just like what we saw in British Columbia with the mountain pine beetle, uh, this completely changes the dynamic of the Quebec provinces and their forest management planning as you've had this tremendous devastation. Uh, uh, I was just talking to Charlie. He, he saw one of my favorite farm mill or uh, sawmills up in, in northern Maine, a uh, 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 crazy sawmill, one man operation doing high quality northern white cedar up in, this, in, in northern Maine. So even though we've had these closures, we have a diversity of markets and that helps keep prices stable. It helps make uh, new investment strong. And I think we're seeing a diverse use of our, of our forest products. So despite the headlines, despite the designation as a federal disaster zone, uh, I see move uh, wood still moving and, and wood still being processed, which to me is, I view as an opportunity. All right, to transition a bit. So the title of the slide was the University of Center, University of Maine Center for Research and Sustainable Forest, uh, the tools, technology, and the science for tomorrow's forest. Uh, this was founded in 2006. Um, I won't explain university politics or, or how we arrange ourselves, but it's a research center. So it's very different than an academic unit. Our mission is primarily to bring people together, very much like the Cary Institute, to collaborate do large scale research that has direct economic impact, not only within Maine, but throughout the, the broader region. Uh, I've been director for the last six years. I obviously didn't plan on a, a two and a half year pandemic, um, but it's been new opportunities. And so what I'll try to highlight is some of the features of all of this. So we still stick to the land grant mission, research, education, outreach, and we focus on kind of four thematic areas, sensors, satellite surveys, so this is the integration of biophysical scientists with, with human dimensions. Um, we do a lot of uh, stakeholder engagement. That's one of the things I'm most proud of is we talk to everyone in Maine and beyond about needs, opportunities, pinch points. 
and we try to find solution-based research. Uh, we also do a lot of professional training. So it's that knowledge to action. Um, so how do we translate science into to actual practice? Um, and we also do a lot of future forecasting as we know that's what drives policy decisions as well as investment as well. So it's really the integration of these three aspects. And, and as people have asked me if, if I'm leaving Maine, I'm at Maine because I can basically speak to a landowner, go do applied science, go back and speak to that landowner. And I see this practice implemented across millions of acres. So just like this relative density concept, been around since Reinecke published on it in the 1930s. Nobody ever understood it. We did a little fancy analysis. We made a spreadsheet calculator. And now a landowner that manages well over a million acres has adopted it and is using it for their forest planning. So that's the exciting things. There's no barriers. Uh, also talking to Gary, we have a, a, a well-known uh, federal delegation that is invested in forest and want to see uh, action happen. And so we can set policy both at a state scale as well as a national scale that I think is quite unique for a, a rural state of maybe 1.2 million people. So th that's the stuff that I'm passionate about. So I see myself being at Maine for a while. Uh, to, to kind of break that further, and I'm sorry this didn't come through, uh, we have four kind of buckets. We have that stakeholder driven research, and I'll try to highlight some of these. Uh, we have long term research sites. So uh, Gary was asking about uh, Howland, so it's still going strong after 30 years. Uh, we have a unique uh, long-term oak pine forest uh, just north of Portland, the Holt Research Forest, uh, which is like the Cary Institute, very a lot of long-term uh, data sets. Communications outreach, which is a huge part. This is one of the toughest parts to engage people on complex issues. Uh, and then we do a lot of information services, which I'll, I'll highlight. Uh, I did want to highlight this. Uh, I spoke to Gary about this, the Northeastern States Research Collaborative been around for 20 years. I think Gary said some of his earlier funding for his uh, invasive pest came from the Northeastern States Research Cooperative. Um, it's been a challenge uh, because of each of the four states kind of have their focal areas, but I think we've found common ground. And I think we recognize the importance of this program given where federal funding is headed and, and people trying to build their careers. NRCRC builds in the regional collaboration and helps support capacity that it supported my early career uh, research program, and, and I'm trying to return the favor to others. So about three years ago, we brought this, this program back from kind of the being mothballed by the, the feds, uh, and we're stronger than ever. So just recently, we funded well over 15 projects, including five projects that supported uh, indigenous tribes to do traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, we have a little bit of a federal hiccup uh, right now, but I hope an RFP will be available in, in, the, in the spring. So again, I would welcome participation and collaboration with the Northeastern States Research Cooperative. Uh, the CFRU, our cooperative, uh, nearing our 50th anniversary, basically all the landowners are, are in yellow, about 9 million acres. And this is really fun. Uh, this is the one time that I know Folks like the Appalachian Mountain Club, the Nature Conservancy, will sit at the exact same table as folks like Weyerhaeuser or the J.D. Irving, completely opposite spectrum, and they'll talk about science needs and the science that they'd like to happen. And so uh, this is well over a half million dollars of contributions from our membership, 34 uh, members run the, the gamut from the TNCs, the Weyerhaeusers, and we do all types of research, biodiversity, forest management, Policy, uh, actually one of our biggest research needs right now is just understanding public perceptions. As you could imagine, um, Mainers feel passionate about having land access, but now you start to have out-of-staters who might not have that land ethic. And so unlike the West, where the majority of that private land ownership is gated, a lot of Maine remains ungated and there's passions about how does this get used and, and just the, the, the heritage around that. Um, so we do a lot of, of great research, and that's directly, they vote on and approve our research. So it's not a bunch of scientists saying that we think they need to do this. This is 34 landowners getting together, setting priorities, and we go find the researchers to do the work to do that. So what are some emphasis areas for us? Um, one of them is what we're calling the Maine Adaptive Civil Culture Network. One of my frustrations as, as, uh, as a, a scientist um, was just having these little maybe half acre to one acre blocks where we tried to look at treatment effects 
but you go talk to a remote sensing scientist or a, a wildlife biologist, a half acre or one acre just doesn't cut it for them. Um, and so what they want are large scale where they can look at the spatial variability and, and the patterns within. And so we have, I think, well over 10 installations uh, covering a diversity of landowners, covering a diversity of site quality habitats, covering a range of forest types. And we're applying at least four to five operationally relative treatments. So this is our first site, uh, the AFM Grand Falls. Uh, and these are roughly about 20 to 30 acre treatment blocks. So you have four or five treatments. We're talking 150 to 200 acres. So this gets the wildlife biologists. So we've done pre-harvest bird surveys. We've had um, folks who are doing eDNA now look at the vernal pools along these. We've had people measure soil compaction due to the, the, the machinery. Uh, we've had remote sensing people look at individual trees, but this is an open data set. So if you're interested in this kind of interaction between large scale management and climate change. So for example, we're talking to the Appalachian Mountain Club about managing for the cold. And so do these treatments have different impacts on snow cover and snow dynamics over the, uh, the winter growing season? So this is an open, open area. Um, our intent was to build the baseline, get these installed, collect basic measurements, but welcome that up to the science community to come. And what they represent is the good, the bad, and the ugly of forest management in Maine. So what we're trying to do is obviously a delayed harvest where we, we uh, let the forest go, which is an important part of this whole pro-forestation movement coming out of Southern New England, that, that the best thing we can do for forests is let them alone and let them grow. That's kind of being carried into the carbon offset markets as we see with NCX and other entities that, that want this delayed harvesting. We have what's our Forest Practices Act, which I could talk about as a three-decade disaster in, in uh, non-regulatory regulatory based uh, forest policy, uh, which is different than incentive-based forest policy, which we've adopted in the last decade, and two other kind of uh, management regimes. So we're very excited to see both in terms of climate resilience, but also in terms of operational viability, uh, which of these are, are available. This has been in the ground for six years. We're still installing these. We're working with people like Baskahegan, Nature Conservancy, even the Appalachian Mountain Club to, to install these. So it's very exciting um, opportunity and I'd welcome participation in this. Uh, not only do we do the CFRU, the cooperative industry, university industry model, uh, we also do this at a national scale. So the National Science Foundation has an industry university collaborative research center program where they incentivize people to bring industry together to do basically the, the stakeholder driven research. And as I was talking to Gary and, and lamenting what used to be the Forest Service R&D is not really the case anymore. Um, uh, politics happen, uh, replacements don't happen. And so it's really a, a skeleton of its former self. And so there's this big, I think, large missing gap in our agenda. And as I spend more time in DC, it's very easy to go there uh, as a farmer, an agriculturist, and make the simple message that you grow food. When we go there as forester, we're talking about Southern pine beetle, we're talking about wildfires, we're talking about spruce budworm. It's very hard to get a compelling narrative together. But this is the opportunity as I see with carbon and ecosystem services. We can talk about the benefits of, fits of, managed, of managed forest. And so I see the Center for Advanced Forestry Systems, which is a consortium of seven universities throughout the uh, United States, as well as some of the larger landowners like Weyerhaeuser, Rainier, Manulife, uh, well over 60 different organizations across the university that come together, talk about research priorities, talk about needs and talk about opportunities. And so I, I think this dynamic of the CFRU continuing to do the on the ground studies that's relevant to places like New England, but then couching that into a broader narrative around the national, uh, a national agenda. And I think carbon, wildfire, other opportunities really, really make that an opportune time to do that. That's, that's something I'm very passionate about. It's amazing what happens when you bring people into the same room and they have these conversations. That's one of the things that I think the pandemic taught us. There's lots of great things you can do over Zoom, but having conversations and, and dynamic dialogues really helps move the needle. A few other things, because I really want to save time for questions. Um, one unique thing that, that we did very early on, uh, you might have known that our governor, Governor Janet Mills, uh, really progressive, 
uh, just got reelected. Uh, one of the first things she did when she took office in 2018 uh, was to set up a Maine Climate Council. Uh, she brought together well over 100 scientists um, to tackle this complex issue. And what she wanted uh, within two years was a science-based uh, climate action plan. And I will say that despite the pandemic, we have delivered that. And I think Maine is a true, room, a true role model for other states to, to, uh, to follow. My frustrations, obviously I'm biased. I'm a terrestrial person. I like forest. Um, but uh, if you've ever been to Maine, what drives the state's agenda are two things. You can probably guess them, lobsters and blueberries. Um, so if you're not affiliated with a, a blueberry farm or a lobsterman, it's hard to get your narrative across. So even though we're the most forested state, uh, our forest industry has well over a eight and a half billion dollar contribution, 5% of the GDP, double what agriculture or marine has. Uh, we don't get the attention, particularly in the press or within Augusta or state capital, that the blueberry folks in the lobby or the lobstermen do. But when we start to talk about climate change and carbon, uh, we want to get this point across. Uh, so this was the first attempt to do a detailed carbon budget for the state. This was a group of four of us just sat down around the table. Fortunately, we had uh, Dr. Dan Hayes who's been uh, part of the state of uh, carbon report soccer for the last two years. He's done this at a global scale. Uh, so we actually adopted the soccer carbon map. So if you've seen this for the recent soccer report, um, we took that framework and we tried to do a deep dive into the carbon budget for the state. So we looked at basically between 2006 and 2016, we tried to do all the pools, follow them to where they go. Of course, our blue carbon friends thought, thought we missed pools or, or they were shocked that the scale was not there. But when you got 17 million acres of forest, the big take home is that if you wanna talk about carbon sequestration, charging or changing the carbon trajectory, we're not gonna go out and plant kelp or actually there's people planting kelp, but we're probably not gonna do that at a sustainable scale. We gotta talk about our forest. And so this was a very detailed budget. We're, we're working on version two right now, but when you boiled it all down, uh, basically, the forest itself was offsetting about 60% of our state's emission. We cheated a little bit. We're a very low populated state, 1.2 million maybe. Uh, when you, as I was talking to Gary, a lot of, as we shift it from our paper mills to, to long-lived forest products, a lot of our lumber is now being used for construction lumber. You take that into account, you're talking about 15%. So overall, we're already offsetting about three quarters of our state's emissions. Uh, if you include the oceans and the freshwater systems, another 3%, but it really it's about the forest. And we've got this, um, I saw the governor a few weeks ago and she quoted this 75%. So it's very simple activities like this that suddenly change the narrative. And I think they have now shifted. They actually formed a forest carbon um, uh, committee to deal with policy and procedures for, for addressing forest carbon. Nationally, we've also got this through to our delegation as well. So if we look at just forest carbon sequestration in an absolute sense, surprisingly, uh, uh, Colorado is, is lowest. If you've been there, a lot of uh, fire, insect outbreaks really devastating the, the forest there. Uh, surprisingly, in the southeast is number one, and then Maine is, is 20th. Uh, but when you look at things as a percent greenhouse gas removal by the state, we're 75th percent or 75 percent. Oregon is roughly about there, maybe 76, 77 percent. Uh, but we're number four in the nation as a percent, which which we've communicated. We believe we can go higher. I think places like Oregon are going to be restricted because of the federal ownership. Um, it's hard to change that kind of trajectory of where that forest is. The wildfires have had an impact as well. But Maine and other parts of New England, we rank pretty high. And I think we can set policy as well as engage our landowners to make this even higher. Uh, so a buzzword now, climate smart management, natural climate solutions. We're very fortunate to have an economist, Adam, um, Adam Diagno, who has worked very closely with the Nature Conservancy at both a national and a global scale. Uh, but he's brought this mandate here to Maine. And so we just did, a. I will say, all of this is available through our website. So if you want this material, I, uh, this presentation should be available as well. But all the details are, are online. We just did extended analysis, like I, I was telling Gary. So here we are with the forest today, 2022. 
budworm, climate change, diversity of landowners, the governor asked us, what can we do to take the forest to make Maine carbon neutral within the next 20 years? And so we ran out a lot of different set of, a lot of stories. Uh, obviously, we're not seeing a tremendous amount of land conversion, maybe in southern Maine, uh, so not the pressures that probably Millbrook is seeing. Uh, TNC has invested heavily in this afforestation, so going to old ag fields and planting. It's hard when you're 89% forested, you're not going to move the needle. Uh, and also what these different colors are is the break-even carbon price that you would need to kind of uh, promote or accelerate these activities. So tree, planting trees, growing trees, getting people to plant them is a very expensive activity. So you're taking about a, a carbon price of about 50 uh, CO2 equivalent, which now most carbon markets may be 20 to 25. So half of that price. Uh, and you don't have that big of a magnitude. Actually, uh, the biggest impact and at a price that I think is fairly affordable at, at, a, at about a 20 to 25 is what uh, Matt Hunter and Bob Seymour talked about uh, well over 30 years ago, this idea of the triad. So the triad is the idea that you, you have a working landscape that has a diversity of uses, three uses, intensive management, which is your lower fraction, your, your probably your better sites that can support growth. Uh, and we're seeing this with some of our landowners in Maine as they think about where to make their strategic investments. So put your investment not across your entire ownership, but in the areas that you can recoup that benefit. The majority of our landscape, maybe 50 to 70% is in kind of this, what we would say the working forest, the matrix. Um, so kind of like the landscape here that we're seeing in, in uh, New York. And then the rest of this is in um, conserved areas or basically preserved areas. So, so your, very, your areas of high biodiversity, your riparian areas, your vernal pools, set asides. So do that. So essentially what we, we looked at was increasing the degree of uh, clear cutting or, or a slightly more intensive harvesting. We're not talking about doubling it or doing anything crazy. We might go from uh, less than 2% plantations to maybe 5%. So we're taking about a fractional landscape and actually we're increasing the set aside area by 20%. So we're taking this triad approach and you can just see the magnitude. We can increase our current baseline by well over uh, 3 million tons uh, per year with this strategy. And if we adopted that today, we could easily be carbon neutral by 2040. So it's these actions that we can do today uh, and we're, we're, there's no silver bullet. We can't just go out and plant trees. It's about this mixed management uh, and active management across the landscape. More importantly, uh, so this is that 10 million acres of managed forest land up in Northern Maine. As I was telling Gary, people love maps. And so what we've done is modeled this at a 30 meter resolution. And so people can see their forest today, but also 50 years into the future under these different scenarios. So you can see how much carbon is there, but more importantly, you can see what species composition. And this is, as we talk about, do you want to site a new mill here? Should we be targeting places like Baxter as our set-asides? Should we be thinking about other portions of the landscape that are, that are beneficial? So we've gone from this stand level to community-based to now this landscape scale uh, approach to get people to think about active management. There's a very exciting report. Uh, so of course you can do great science, uh, but the first thing the landowners are going to do is dismiss it, um, say it can't be done. Uh, and so over the last two years, uh, we pulled together a diverse set of commercial landowners, own well over 8 million acres of, of northern Maine. Uh, and we've done a very detailed economic assessment that actually these biological findings have both economic viability as well as uh, politically uh, are approachable. So this is a, a great approach to actually going from research to implementation now. Uh, this should be uh, reports. This was led by John Hagen, formerly of the Manament Institute, a real, a real uh, knowledge broker and, and statesman, ambassador. So I actually think this is gonna happen and I'm very excited about it. I'm very passionate about this. This is about taking our science, doing a proactive approach to address a multi-complex issue of carbon, climate change, fiber markets, and also that social working and environment. I've already mentioned budworm, I, I will skip over, but this is a big concern for us. So you could do the best climate smart management activities. We could be carbon neutral in 10 years. You have a major budworm outbreak and all of that hard work quickly goes out the window and you lose that. And there's no recovery uh, from that. 
A big thing for us, obviously, is remote sensing. Uh, so just like in a diverse forest, like around Millbrook, we are developing uh, species-based maps. Uh, so we're working with well over 14 different commercial species. We aggregate those into forest maps. And so Maine will have one of the first wall-to-wall, -wall, 10 meter resolution uh, forest cover maps by distinct forest type species, but also by individual distinct species, which opens the door as we think about biodiversity, uh, climate change vulnerability, and all the rest. But again, you can do great science, but it's about getting the hands into practitioners. And so this is what we've also invested in, not only doing the science to produce wonderful maps like this, but how do we make these maps accessible to the general public, policymakers, as well as landowners themselves? So this is what we call the, the Forest Estimation Status and Trends Tool, or Forest. Uh, it's available online. It's a very uh, easy format, but to me, it presents trade-offs. So what we're looking at here is the forest cover map that I just showed. Um, the green here is areas of a keystone species like Canadian lynx. Uh, so landowners, as you deal with these certifications, have to deal with uh, ensuring biodiversity. So obviously you don't wanna have areas of high budworm vulnerability coupled with uh, high uh, Canadian lynx habitat probability. We're also gonna include carbon, carbon stocks into this. So it becomes those trade-offs of large scale management that has target of objectives, but is driven by actual um, knowledge and information. So anyone can go down this, they can look at this. Uh, we're, we're continuing to enhance this because we really feel like given these people the tools and the technology they need to make uh, on the ground decisions is critical. Finally, I will, I will end here just briefly. Um, when we were declared an economic disaster the zone in, in 2016, our delegation doubled down on the forest industry. They brought in the Economic Development Administration. We got a $2 million grant and we went through this revisioning exercise that is just concluding its second phase. We knew we weren't gonna rebuild these pulp mills. Um, so we need a new, a new model. And not only, as I said, it's about bringing people into the same room. So this is one of the first time that loggers, truckers, mill owners, landowners all got into the same room rather than fighting across the hall in Augusta over policy measures. They had to come together and face a crisis. And so this strategic planning process called Formain has led to a lot of documents that basically have branded us that we can grow. We can go from an eight to eight and a half billion dollar industry to now well over 12 billion industry through making strategic investments in research, strategic investment in partners, and also by managing this, the forest as we ha have done holistically. So as I mentioned to many of you, um, how do you take this into a framework? Uh, so this is kind of where I'm going right now. It's about the integration of these fields. And so um, what we want to do is leverage AI to make more informed decisions. We want to work with our rural communities the, the buck sports or the former mill towns to make them more resilient and adapt to it. Now, if you go to Northeast Kingdom of, of Vermont, you have mountain bike villages that, that are thriving. So how can we adopt that in Maine? There's a lot of interest in green materials. So this this whole idea of cellulosic nanomaterials. And the biggest issue right now is not actually the forest resource or the forest technologies or forest markets. It's actually the workforce to implement the management as well as, as that. So what we wanna do is cultivate both within our urban and, and rural communities, this environmental kind of ethic that I'm seeing in the younger generation is how do you actually make a career from that? So we're something called the green collar pathways. So hopefully this uh, leaves some time for a question. I went a little bit longer than I liked, but hopefully I've indicated that it's a highly unique resource. I think well-managed, I think it's poised for a real opportunity as we think about these complex issues. Obviously the biggest things as we think about is markets, natural disturbances like uh, budworm or, or insects, even fire now with the, the droughts that are being talked about, the changing environmental conditions as we, as we talk about. And most importantly, skilled labor, not only the people that can drive the trucks that do the harvesting, but also the layout, the management, uh, as well as setting the policy that, that, that helps drive this whole framework. So again, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I appreciate uh, inviting the Mainer to come down and, and talk about our state. And I'd welcome any thoughts or input that you might have at this point. So thank you.
Thank you, Erin. That was so interesting to learn about all the different projects that you're working on. And I'm always happy to hear that there's something hopeful maybe <laughs> to look into the future with all of the kind of gloom and doom that we hear about sometimes. So thank you for that. Um, we do have about five minutes for questions. So maybe we'll take a couple from here in our live audience and then I'll take a look at the Zoom. So does anyone have a question for Erin? Jane. I think it's a great question. Yeah, if, if I could oh, pause oh, yeah, real yeah, quick, yeah. if you could just repeat the question so that our Zoom folks can hear yeah. it, please. So the question was about spruce budworm in Maine. Um, uh, not to get into biology, and maybe Gary could answer this much better than I could, but there's always been this weird dynamic between budworm in the lake states and budworm in the um, in in kind of the northern area. Lake states have, tend to have small outbreaks that are more frequent, uh, don't last as long. Um, here in, in the Northeast, um, we tend to have these very large ep outbreaks that are episodic that last longer, have much more damaging impact. Um, uh, we're not sure why it hasn't occurred in Maine. We have a lot of forests that be very ripe for, for the budworm. Uh, we have a very intensive survey looking for it. Um, it. It keeps coming up to that threshold where we think it's gonna suddenly pop and change, but it hasn't yet. Um, so people have been looking at birds. We've actually seen a shift in the bird comp uh, bird community composition that, that you get a lot more people that eat the budworm. Uh, I do think there's a lot of support for this early intervention strategy. If you can keep population below that epidemic uh, or that kind of outbreak status, you, you can manage it better. Uh, but I really think it's just a shift in the windfall that it's, we've been very fortunate that when, um, when when they're going through the larva stage that they tend to shift northward rather than southward. Um, actually, the Quebecers believe that, and Maine is hopeful that this could be the last Maine outbreak because uh, actually our uh, one drawback or one advantage of a warmer winters is they don't reach that 20, that 20 degree mi minus 20 C that they need to overwinter. we actually got warmer winters so they, they actually don't complete their life cycle uh, so, so we're hopeful that if we can escape this last outbreak, that, that that's the last of the budworm in, in Maine. So one of our Zoom questions, actually, if I may, is also about spruce budworm. So while we're on that train, the question is, are there non-target consequences for spraying for spruce budworm? Yeah, that's been a very common program. Um, the, the New Brunswick people, I'm going to forget their uh, Healthy Forest Partnership, as I think the group, um, the Canadian uh, government and the province of New Brunswick have invested heavily, fifty million dollar uh, five year project to to address budworm, uh, and a big part of that has not only been the science of the application about detecting budworm, but also uh, communicating to the public. Uh, so this is BT. This is application of BT, widely used by organic farmers. Um, very specific to to budworm itself. They only spray once. Um, very during a very short window of period when the budworm is active. So these are very targeted applications, non-toxic chemical. Uh, we've not been able to detect any long-term environmental issues. Very different than the 70s, as you could imagine. A lot of what drove Maine's forest policy were the heavy spray programs, uh, as well as the large clear cuts that resulted from the salvage harvesting. Um, I would say those were a small environmental impact to what we've seen of the three to four decades of, I would say, um, highly regulatory forest policy that has changed management across 17 million acres. So the clear cuts, uh, the application of insecticides, I agree, had short-term environmental damages, but the long-term play out of that on the landscape is at a scale that is not even comparable. But yeah, I think, and the positive thing is, they had in New Brunswick, they sprayed intensively for a few years. And again, these were only the hot spots. It wasn't just broad scale application. Now they can, can't even keep their sprayers active. So uh, they're actually dormant and, and don't know what to do with the excess BT that they have, or even the, the time that they have devoted to the airplanes. So, so it's, it's been a highly successful program. Any other questions in our in-person audience? Gary. Early on, you mentioned the increase in speech uh, in the forest. 
Uh, and the U.S. forces don't seem to really need to be to European forces to use their activities and all that time. But what is it about America's beach that, that doesn't allow us to do this? And is there some effort to try to use this resource that's going on? Yeah, no, uh, the, yep, the question was the application or utilization of American beach in contrast to European beach. Uh, and this was something I spoke with Charlie Cannon last night about. Um, yeah, it's a wonderful wood. It's beautiful. Um, it, it's It's got a lot of great properties. Um, we haven't seen as much interest in it. I don't know why. Um, I think one of the challenges is just managing it itself. Um, uh, as you can imagine, it's kind of like this... Uh, poking the, the bee's nest, once you poke uh, uh, um, a beach thicket, you suddenly get 10 times the amount of beach that you ever had. Um, so it becomes this kind of chicken or egg type of scenario. So managers are really reluctant to try to even do anything with it. I think what we've seen is they don't reach a size that you could manage it effectively. Uh, one idea that Charlie had was, was coppicing, which I think is a really interesting idea. If we just want to biomass, if we just want to produce fiber i think that's a really interesting idea i don't know um, but that is a big focus i think with uh, this nanotechnology because they don't care what species obviously uh, uh, wood cellulose and and they have certain properties but when you get in down to the nano scale um, what they want is fiber and a continuous regular source of fiber so i think innovative that has been communicated that the biggest need that we need is innovative uses of low-grade fiber, and I think that is one innovative use, high application. Uh, I'm actually surprised. Uh, Sappy, um, they have they just expanded their mill in Portland. They know that paper and, and paper associate products are on their way out, and they have been highly innovative in the amount of materials that they've developed and and application. They are very much in the high end thing, so. Uh, we have a, a call scheduled with Sappy soon, so I, I would like to ask them about Beach. If anybody was working on it, it would be Sappy, and I, I would think that's their whole game is the value add and high end stuff. So I, I think, given what Charlie was talking about, the uses of rayon, uh, that that's that's a beautiful use of Beach, which I would highly support. Do we have time for another question? Hopefully, okay. We'll we'll do maybe one more. Um, considering how much we were you were talking about carbon today. Um, this question is, are there any active forest carbon markets in Maine? And if so, does the state oversee those markets? Uh, yeah, um, right now there's not currently. There's, I believe one in Vermont that's been targeted primarily to private landowners. That's also what we've tried, the main market is trying to target the small landowners because obviously they don't have the scale to, to enter a traditional carbon offset market. Uh, as you can imagine, that becomes highly political and, and complicated. Uh, so I, I know Vermont has tried to develop kind of like um, similar to what Finland has of, of like cooperatives so that people pull acreage and that you're able to, to get a, a benefit to that. That was NCX's model was working with specific landowners, which we saw does not uh, particularly, uh, uh, doesn't work at an economic scale. Um, that has been an identified need, and there's people working on it, but there is no current active market. There are uh, several landowners that have sold to the traditional markets, and I would say that some of the bigger landowners in Maine are now kicking the tires of, of carbon offset markets. I think the key that people should recognize is you can go through the verification product or the, the process, but you don't have to sell your credits. So I think a lot of people right now are hedging, and so they are going through the process, they're getting credits issued, but are not selling the credits. Okay, so kind of a related question to that is, considering how strong the proforestation and afforestation narrative is right now, how do you counter that when you talk to landowners about carbon? It's really scary. It's it's amazing how quickly the proforestation, and everyone is familiar with this, this is an idea coming from uh, Yale. Um, uh, it is really captured southern New England. Um, obviously, we see it play out in Massachusetts. Um, there's places in Vermont and New Hampshire. It's made it a little bit in, in Portland, Maine. Um, I think we have to talk about the benefits of management, managed forest. And I think we've been talking about that for two decades, but, but it's abstract, right? Um, people don't relate to forest and 
different ways. And so that makes it very hard to tell a compelling narrative. But with carbon, climate change, people get it. And so now you're talking about a natural climate solution. You're talking about the tremendous benefits that forests offer. So I think we got to talk about it in a larger narrative. I think the other flip side of it is, is how can someone from New Haven go talk to someone in Millinocket and tell them it's over, you should just move? It's, it's about the human element of that as well. Uh, and then we've actually seen a resurgence in Millinocket. There's people now with the pandemic that are moving to a former mill town, doesn't even have the mill that are present because they want that lifestyle of being surrounded by forest and the outdoor opportunities that those operate. And I think it's an educational opportunity, right? They're now seeing mill trucks, they're seeing logging. Um, they access the forest through privately owned lands. So I, I, that's what I've been commuting to our Forest Product Society is, is we really need to be proactive and seize this unique opportunity that, that forests play. And, and I think that's important. Aforestation, I don't know. It's a really hard one to change, but it's a really simple math problem. There's less than a thousand acres in Maine that are available to be planted. And I would say probably portions of New York so it's about the bang for buck and, and invest in strategies that are going to have the impact, but are also cost effective. Well, thank you. I think that's just about all the time we have for today. But I hope to see those of you who can make it at our happy hour here at four and also over lunch if you're able to make it. So thank you, Aaron, again for sharing with us. And uh, let's yeah, let's all show our gratitude for making the short trip for Maine. <laughs> thank you.